Greetings, everybody. Get your King James Bible. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. This is going to be, my opinion anyways, an interesting study. Ezekiel 37. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is the Valley of Dried Bones, the Resurrection, prophesied thousands of years ago. All right, let's take a look at Ezekiel 37 and verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were many men very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry well, what does that mean, very dry? It means they've been there a long time and the sun had beaten on them and there wasn't anything, no moisture at all. Verse 3, And he, the Lord, and he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, Thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones. Prophesy upon these bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Now, whether you're in the New Testament or the Old Testament, now the Hebrew word is in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament it's the Greek word, but the word for spirit, wind, and breath are all the same root word. Believe it or not. Now, you'll probably hear people say that, uh, they'll say, well, God is one. God is one. And when you hear people say that, yeah, God is one. But God made man in his image, and man is said to have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Three parts make up one man. And then you got those that'll say, oh, well, no, 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 that's not right. The Holy Spirit is just an it, just like electricity. And then basically what they're going to do is turn around and just turn Jesus into just a human being. And then you've only got God the Father. That's it. One, you know, oneness. They call that oneness. When you hear that stuff, uh, you've got somebody that's a deceiver. And if they're not purposely trying to deceive, they have absolutely virtually zero Bible knowledge and shouldn't even be teaching. Now look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, that's his body, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that's a spirit, same word as spirit, breathed, breath, wind, spirit, same word. 
whether it's in the Greek or the Hebrew, doesn't matter. So, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So he's got a body, he's got a spirit, and man became a living soul. Body, spirit, soul. You know, right here in one verse. So, so when you start looking at the word wind and breath and spirit. All right, so let's see. Uh, let's go back to Ezekiel 37, verse 4. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Remember, God breathed into the, uh, the Adam's nostrils, and he had the breath, of, you know, the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Same type of thing here. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Verse six, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you. And cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them. I believe sinew is uh, cartilage and ligaments. Uh, let me look it up. Yep, I was right. Sinew, a piece of tough fibrous tissue uniting muscle to bone or bone to bone, a tendon or ligament. And believe it or not, I took anatomy and physiology in a medical type setting. So instead of saying tendons and ligaments, they just say sinew. Verse eight, and when I beheld lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. So they got a body, but there's no spirit in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Ah, there you go. Wind, breath, spirit. I did a Bible study on this topic. But if you ask me where it was, well, you'd have to look it up. You know, when you go to my homepage, when you click on my name, you'll go to the homepage and to the top, towards the top right corner, there's a little thing, looks like a magnifying glass. You click on that, there's a little box, and you type in spirit or something like that. And a bunch of videos will pop up with that of my studies. People, I've got over 1,500 studies. Now, I can't remember where they all are. But I know I did it because I remember doing these studies. And YouTube keeps deleting them. As fast as I put them up, they delete them. So what can I tell you? Verse 9. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may 
live. Now, uh, in case you were wondering, if you don't believe in body, soul, and spirit, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, wholly as in complete and total, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body, your whole spirit and soul and body, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there you go. Body, soul, and spirit. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Now remember, Jesus had been crucified. And now, the uh, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind wind breath there you go a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the holy ghost Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, same thing, right? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Huh. So let's go back to Ezekiel, I guess, 37 and verse 9. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of the man, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Did you know the Lord has an army? Oh, yeah. Israel was called an army. Believe it or not. Why is that? Because they're going to fight against God's enemies. Not that he needs an army, but he has one. You know. Israel was called God's army. All right, is Israel have an army? How about 2 Chronicles 25 and verse 7? But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. Now remember, there was a time when Israel and Judah split. And in Jeremiah 3 and verse 8, God divorced Israel because of their wickedness. So Israel is considered an army. How about Joel 2.11? And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Good question. Now a really good one is in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 
David is facing Goliath. Verse 43. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. In other words, I'm going to kill you and feed you to the vultures. Verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. The God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass, carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Boy, I love that. All right, let's go to Ezekiel 37, verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, the dead bones, right? And they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Wow. Where do we read about that? Well, let's take a look. All right, let's go to John chapter 11. We're going to read about Lazarus. Hopefully you know this story. Verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his, his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, him who thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, said, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Roman Catholic Church is trying to kill you. You're going to go, what are you going to do? Go back there? Oh, wait, that's the demon nominational uh, translation. Verse 8, his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. Goest thou thither again? Yeah, that's the King James translation. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then his disciples, I'm sorry, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. 
Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. Now let me tell you something. Even if uh, Lazarus had only passed out, had been unconscious for four days, you don't drink water for four days, you're dead. I mean, three days is about it. Uh, if you're in the desert, you might even, you might make it two days, God willing. But four days, you're. I don't think there's any medical records of people living four days with no water. That just doesn't happen. So even if he passed out, if he didn't have a drink of water for four days, he's dead anyways. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been the here, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Listen to this. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. How's that for faith? Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Well, listen to this. Listen carefully. Verse 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Do you know that Martha had more Bible knowledge in some areas than the, the Sadducees? Did you know that? I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now in Acts 23 and verse 8, for the Sadducees, now the Sadducees were a, a denomination of Jews. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. See, the Sadducees perform the office of the Levites, and they only accepted the five books of Moses as their scripture, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Leviticus was the for the tribe of Levi, and it had to do with temp, uh, uh, worship at the tabernacle or the temple. They didn't believe in the resurrection because it wasn't mentioned in the first five books of the Bible. But the Sadducees did. So here it is. These group of Jews don't even believe there's a resurrection. I mean, really? So when you die, that's it? You know? Well, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Live for today. Uh, right? Why not? I mean, if that's your whole theology... So, let's see. Let's go back to John 11, verse 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he, Lazarus, shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. 
I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Oh, boy. Let's skip down to verse 40. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was lain, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. Oh, yeah. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them which things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? You know, what are we going to do? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Not the uh, Romans. Not the Romans. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Wow. Here's an interesting, obscure story. Let's go to Matthew 27. We're talking about the crucifixion here. Verse 35. And they crucified him, Christ, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. No, you wouldn't, you liars. Even if he came down from the cross, you still wouldn't have believed him. Verse 43. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. 
Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, why would the Lord forsake, turn his back and forsake Jesus? Well, he's taking the sins of the world on. Now, this is, I think this is Hebrew. I'm not 100% sure. It could be Aramaic, but Aramaic is just a dialect of Hebrew. Verse 47, listen to this. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. Elijah. That's the Greek rendering of Elijah. So here it is. Jesus is saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But they didn't even understand what he was saying. They go, Oh, this man's calling for Elias. What? And then, and then these Hebrew roots people want you to believe that everybody spoke Hebrew. And that his name really wasn't Jesus. It was Yahuwah or Yeshua, or Yahuahua, or Yahoo, or whatever, you know, whatever they come up with. No. Jesus spoke Hebrew, and they didn't even understand what he was saying. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they are, they said, oh, this man calleth for Elias. Uh, I don't think so. They don't, they didn't understand what Christ was saying. And you're going to tell me his real name is Yahuwah? I don't think so. They're a bunch of idiots. 5,000 Greek, partial Greek manuscripts. Zero Hebrew ones. Verse 48, And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Yeah. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, from heaven to the earth. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Listen to this. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept, or were dead, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. I would have loved to have heard the stories that these people would have had to say. Really. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. So here it is. A Roman centurion had more sense then those learned you-know-whos. All right, let's go back to Ezekiel 37, verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves. Huh. Didn't we just read that? Yeah, we did. And cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Well, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth, face, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Their works. You know, you're not saved by your works, but uh, your works will decide your reward or your punishment. Boy, they don't like to talk about that. Uh-uh. Oh, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, James chapter 2 says the devils even believe. So are they saved? No. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. You know, World War II in the Pacific, the war between the United States and Japan, there is going to be a lot of dead. A lot of dead coming up out of the sea. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Ezekiel 37. I guess we'll read verse 13. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord." The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, for all the house of Israel, his companions. Now, this is beyond the scope of this Bible study, but I've got other Bible studies on it. Israel and Judah were split in the days of King Solomon's son when he took over. You had Jeroboam and Rehoboam, two different kings, one of Israel, one of Judah. I mean... And uh, Israel's capital was Samaria. Judah's capital was Jerusalem. They had different kings, different capitals, different land areas. And in Jeremiah 3.8, God divorced Israel, but not Judah. And then in Jeremiah 31.31, 31, God said that he would have a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Jeremiah 3.8 and Jeremiah 31.31. 31. Look it up. But uh, your Hebrew roots people will say, oh, no, no, no. It's not a new covenant. It's the renewed covenant. We're going to go back and do animal sacrifice again. We don't, you know, that blood of Jesus stuff. No, 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 no. We got to keep all those laws. Uh... Boy, those people are idiots. I know who they work for. And it's not Jesus. And it's not God the Father either. They work for the other guy. Yeah, keep all those laws. Yeah, break one of those laws and you're, you're damned. So there's going to be two sticks. One for Israel, one for Judah. Verse 17. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become 
one in thine hand. What? Two becoming one? How? Oh, that's simple. Uh, Paul, you know, that's who those Hebrew roots people hate. Galatians 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus, uh, in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Doesn't say you become spiritual seed. Uh-uh. It says if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. When I first came to the Lord, that was beaten into my skull, and I'm pleased. Tell that to the Zombie churches. Ezekiel 37, 17, And join them one to another into one stick. Ah, what's the stick? Jesus is the branch, remember? In John 15, 15, Jesus, I'm sorry, John 15, 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. There you go. So, join them. Ezekiel 37, 17, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? You know, uh, hey, Ezekiel, what in the world are you talking about? That's the Bob translation. Verse 19, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereupon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes." And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation. And I will make them one nation in the land, upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. Huh, one king. Where have I read that before? Oh, let me think for a few seconds here. Uh, one king. Hmm. Oh, wait, I remember. Revelation chapter 19. Let's start in verse 14. And the armies, remember we were talking about armies? And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Ah, okay, there we go. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Word of God, Christ Jesus, right? Now remember this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, very important. 
Verse 15. For this we say unto you. Oh, here's Paul again. All those Hebrew roots people, they hate Paul. Paul, because Paul proves all their lies and false doctrines for what they are from the pits of hell. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. You know, the dead, right? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Oh, wait a minute. No, no. God's going to come from heaven with a secret rapture, with a whisper. I don't think so. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. The resurrection people haven't, isn't that what we just read in Re uh, Ezekiel 37? Yes. The dead bones? Yes. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. People, if you're not caught up in the air to be with the Lord, it's the wrong Messiah. I don't care what the you know who's over in the Middle East say. If they build their little temple and they say, Oy vey, Messiah has come. If you're not caught up into the air, it's the wrong one. Period. That's one of the most important chapters in the Bible. That's why that's why the pre-trib rapture was invented. So that you'll lose your faith, reject Christ, and accept their Messiah. All right, Ezekiel 37. Verse 21, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. Well, duh, when they rise up in the resurrection, and they come with him in the clouds, he's going to bring them into the land, right? Verse 22, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David my servant shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. Didn't Jesus say he was the good shepherd? Yes. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. 
and the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. I don't know about you, but I think this is a great, wonderful chapter. Unbelievable. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And that's the end of Ezekiel 37.